This is an excellent course, and it's an honor to be here. Um, I want to kind of talk about maybe perhaps a, a change in name, but perhaps also a philosophical shift in how we treat chronic sinusitis. And these are the patients before they've gone to the operating room. These are the ones that initially land in your office. So, you know, chronic sinusitis and the management of it can feel like your hands are full. You have so many options. Antibiotics, how long, what dose, steroids, nasal sprays, irrigations. And it can feel confusing. And then there's competing influences with cost and insurance demands and institutional demands. And it can be a challenge to figure out what's best for your patient. And it can feel confusing. And, you know, historically, we've called it maximal medical therapy, but we never really had a consensus of what that represented. And so now we're saying, well, it's appropriate medical therapy. And so what does that mean? So it, it can be challenging to figure out how that uh, relates to your practice and how do we navigate through that space. But fortunately, we have guidelines. And so I think we've alluded to this paper now several times today. This is the, exec, uh, the executive summary. What we showed previously was the, the full summary. This is 18 pages. This should be on, I think, all of our must-read list. Uh, this was published in February of last year and really offers us a nice, clear roadmap of uh, guidelines for managing these patients. So what I want to review is the two phenotypic variants of sinusitis, those with and without polyp polyposis. I'm not going to go over diagnostic criteria. I'm assuming they've met that. They've never had surgery. There's no confounding variables here. So this is kind of your garden variety sinusitis patient that lands in your office. They've de novo. They've not had any treatment thus far. And you're deciding, how am I going to manage those patients? We start with saline irrigations. You know, the, the areas that we have the highest level of evidence, so level A evidence, is going to be saline irrigations and intranasal corticosteroid sprays. Saline irrigations are a recommendation out of the ICAR guideline. Uh, high volume, low pressure irrigations tend to be best. Isotonic to hypertonic, um, greater than 200 milliliters was the definition of it. Intranasal corticosteroid sprays, uh, we've alluded to this earlier today. Um, various manufacturers make different brands. Uh, that's not necessarily shown superior to one over the other. Uh, typical regimen is two sprays once a day. Uh, most of the guideline was written for four weeks of continuous therapy. We are seeing some uh, payers looking for eight weeks of therapy, but in general, the guideline and the research is shown greater than three, so preferably four weeks. Antibiotics um, are considered an option. Now, this is the non, non polyposis patient, um, and this is according to the guideline. There's macrolide and, and non macrolide based therapies. I think there's a growing trend towards macrolide based therapy. This is also in consideration of the con or culture directed therapy, too. In terms of uh, prednisone in the non-polyp patient, there's insufficient evidence available. And I think this is probably one of the bigger shifts. Historically, we and the, the dogma was steroids, antibiotics for your sinusitis patients. And, you know, really in this phenotypic variant with non-polypoid patients, it's steroids, uh, there's insufficient evidence. And I think there's a trend away from that. With regards to antibiotic irrigations, antifungal irrigations, uh, colloidal silver, or IV antibiotics, uh, there's a strong recommendation against in any of those forms of therapy in your non-polypoid patient. And I'm not going to cover over xylitol and manuka honey. Those are considered surfactants, and they were insufficient evidence for a recommendation on that. Uh, but we just completed a trial and happy to talk to you about it offline. So for my patient that's a non-polypoid patient, this is my typical uh, regimen or protocol, a high-volume saline irrigation. I provide them recipe and instructions on how to do it with Flonase, two sprays once a day. Not Flonase, but Ticazone, two sprays once a day. Um, and then I consider using a macrolide-based therapy if I can't get a culture-directed therapy on them, and I'll do that for three weeks. The polyp patients, similar recommendation for saline irrigations. It's also going to be uh, two to three times a day with a high-volume, low-pressure irrigation system uh, with an isotonic to hypertonic uh, saline irrigation. It's considered a recommendation according to the ICAR guideline. Um, some minor irritations associated with this, but uh, generally well tolerated. Same with intranasal corticosteroid sprays. I haven't alluded to the non-standard delivery techniques of budesonide. Um, that's uh, we'll cover briefly at the end. So this is uh, the standard spray-based therapy uh, of your intranasal steroid sprays that you're familiar with, and that's a, a strong recommendation for those medications as well. When it comes down to antibiotics, uh, for the patients with polyps, it's also considered an option for antimicrobial therapy. Again, we have to divide this in macrolides and non-macrolides, and then there's the culture-direct therapies as well, too. For macrolide therapy, it was considered an option. For non-macrolide therapy, it was um, insufficient evidence and um, more towards the macrolide therapy. Again, three week, greater than three weeks duration would be the preferred. And there was a recommendation for steroids in your polypoid patient. The unknown is what dose do you use, where do you start, how long do you do this? We, we do know it's a short course, uh, but where does that start? Does it start at 30, does it start at 60, you know, does it start at 40? I think that's the area of uncertainty. My course is 30, 20, 10, four days each. 
When it comes to adjunctive medications like orontohistamines or antileukotrienes, uh, these are considered an option in the patients. I think that in my practice, those patients with polyps and asthma, I'm going to lean more towards this, and this is where I do rely heavily on uh, Drew and uh, other colleagues from allergy to kind of get their opinion in terms of the allergy management as well as the asthma management, but it's considered an option in the guideline. For uh, patients with AERD, uh, desensitization was considered, uh, was recommended. That This is something that is debated and there is opinions on this. Um, on, you know, the, the guideline uh, ultimately distilled it down to a recommendation for those patients with proven AERD. Um, this would be where your allergy colleagues can be very useful to help navigate through that, pa that space. So my algorithm for patients with polyps, uh, I use saline and nasal steroid sprays as discussed. I use prednisone 30, 20, 10, four days each. And I will consider using a macrolide-based therapy in these patients. If I do it, I am going to use it for 30 days. Um, I do 500 milligrams, or sorry, 21 days at 500, mil 500 milligrams. Um, and lastly, on budesonide irrigations, I, I think it's a great tool. Again, we're talking the context right now of non-surgical patients, so these are the patients that have not had any surgical procedure done on them. It's considered an option even in these patients as well. I think the issue has become a value judgment in terms of cost. It's some, it can be challenging to get patients uh, through their insurance plan um, and can have substantial costs associated with that. Thank you. Anything I can answer about medical therapy? First off, you made that look way too easy. I mean, that was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Great job, great picture, too. This is Mount Baker, yeah. What about Lasix that we've read about and heard about for a couple of years? Can we apply it, providing it? Yeah, I, I'm certainly not applying it in my practice right now. I can't specifically comment about Lasix. Um, there's some um, emerging evidence regarding ACE inhibitors, um, but I can't comment specifically about LASIKs. I'll defer to maybe those with more experience, Dr. Senior.